Anna Quinlan is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and best selling author of 14 books. She's also known as America's resident sane person. Anna Quinlan, thanks so much for coming today. Thank you, Chessa. <laughs> You've written about um, the fact that your mother died young and um, your need for imaginary conversations with her. Is that something you still do? Can you tell us about that? It's not as sharp as it once was, but it, it just so happens that our goddaughter's mother, one of my close friends, um, just died, and I had to warn her hmm. uh, about the telephone. It's a wonderful invention, except it's convinced us we can talk to anybody. There's that kind of immediacy, and I know um, with my mother, I would pick up the phone and expect, mm. you know, to find her on the other end. It's it's a real common problem for people mm. when someone they love has died, mm -hmm. and uh, and I just told Julia to beware of it. I, I think the thing that inoculates you a little bit against that sense of loss is having children of your own. One of the things that happens when your mother dies is that you feel like the last of your line, in some way, and it really was. Um, when the kids were born that I began to see that I was part of a long line that would continue and that was helpful to me. Right, because you were 19 when she passed away. Exactly. And so you had quite a stretch of time before you had kids, so yeah. And all those things, all those landmarks, I mean I graduated from college, right. my mother wasn't there. I got yeah. married, my mother wasn't there. Right. Um, even having the kids um, sure. without her there. When you most um, want. Yeah, but at the same time, having them becoming the mother as well as the daughter, right. it really took the curse off of Mother's Day. Oh. I mean, there were years there where oh. it would be a Sunday in May and I'd see people carrying flowers and I'd think, oh, not this again. Mm -hmm. And then once I had the kids and I was getting, you know, those little clay whatever's yes. they are and crayon drawings, it changed the whole feeling of it for right. me. Right. And do you think that... Um Losing her at 19 is one of the reasons that you became America's resident sane person because you were seeking comfort, seeking wisdom. I think it gave me a different perspective on life than most of my peers have. Um, I mean, I think if you watch somebody try to hold on for dear life to a really simple, ordinary existence, the only thing you can conclude at the end of it is that a simple, ordinary existence is just about the best thing out there. Mm -hmm. And I think usually when you're in your 20s and even your 30s, you don't get that. Yeah. But I walked around every day going, I'm breathing, yes. you know? And that sense of, of the gift. Uh, uh, Laura Linney said in an interview not long ago that, that she had been given the gift of getting older. And I think it's because of her close friend Natasha Richardson, who of course died very precipitously and didn't get that gift. And I think I was aware of that at a very young age. Right. And do you think that um, you would have left a good job, like a great job at the New York Times to be with your kids if you hadn't had that sense? That's an interesting question. I'm not sure of the answer because part of the thing with my kids wasn't just that my mother was gone, it was that my mother was good, and I was trying to be a really good mother um, to my children. So I'm not sure if, if I would have followed that lead um, had she not died, but um, I think I might have anyhow, because I, I, I just had this incredible model for how to be a mother. So I have this quote, I would love if you could read this, mm -hmm. about um, your mother here. Sometimes, missing my mother, I lose track of whether I am missing a human being or a way of life. Our mothers only slowly become people to us as we grow older, and they do too. There is something primitive about this love and this loss. What does it mean to sleep beneath the heart of another person, safe and warm, for almost a year? No scientist can truly say. It's a beautiful, beautiful quote. Oh, thank you. You've talked about the fact that you have created for yourself in the past a new identity, and um, that you constructed this new identity, and then you found you liked it, and it became real. So could you tell us a bit more about that? Did you dis dis discern the need for a 
character trait that you didn't have? How, how did you discern that new identity that you wanted? Oh my goodness, I think all young women do that. I think all young women start out not by analyzing their own personality and, and honoring it, but by constructing a persona. I mean, all of middle school is nothing but one persona after another. There's not an authentic girl in the eighth grade. <laughs> and I say that with great love for eighth graders because I've had an eighth grade girl and I've been an eighth grade and girl. And there may be one or two exceptions, I suppose. And as time goes by, I think you begin to merge that persona and your own personality. Um, but for me, uh, particularly because my father pushed me so hard and wanted me to be so successful and so accomplished, uh, I think I kind of developed this carapace of a person who really went full speed ahead. And as I've written, um, for years I resented him for that because I had this real push push to my character which is reflected in my career. What did he actually do or we'll say? Oh, my father's favorite mantra was winners need not explain. I mean that's, you know, <laughs> you hear that enough times and you think, well, only winning will do. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then there came this sort of critical moment and I'm not sure why it came when it did when I realized that the person that my father had pushed me so hard to be was someone I really liked being. Because you were enjoying the work? I was enjoying the work. I, frankly, I was enjoying the accomplishment. I, 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 the merger of the personality and the persona had become complete and I, I felt happy and secure being that person. Mm. And the great thing about that was that I was able to release any kind of resentment I had against my father and say, well, heck, Daddy, as always, you were right. Well, this book, this is now in paperback, Still Life with Breadcrumbs, and um, it's fiction, but it's also very useful, almost in the way of self-help. Now, it doesn't read a bit like self-help, but the end result is helpful. So can you tell us a little bit about the plot of this? Um, after my last novel, Every Last One, which was quite dark, I decided I wanted to do two things I'd never written, I've never done before. I wanted to write a love story, mm -hmm. and I wanted to write a novel with a happy ending. Mm -hmm. uh, some of my novels have had a certain kind of resolution, but not necessarily what you would call a happy ending. Um, and along the way, I started to think about it, a couple of things that interest me. Um, the idea of getting older, um, the idea of no longer having the life you once had and whether it's possible to create, as Scott Fitzgerald said, a second act mm -hmm. in your life. Um, the notion of art and what art means, um, whether art is what the outside world tells you it is or whether Something it's felt. what you feel inside. And over time I developed this character in my mind, a 60-year-old photographer named Rebecca Winter, who is running out of money, which was another issue I wanted to think about. It's interesting, despite the fact that particularly Americans at this moment in time are so interested in money, mm -hmm. It's almost never explored in novels. If you want to read about money in novels, mm. you go back to Edith Wharton, Mary Gordon. you go back to John Galsworthy, mm -hmm. you go back to... So I wanted to look at that. And Rebecca's at a moment in her life where she's famous, but there's no money in fame per se, right. unless people are buying your work. Right. And she's looking for new inspiration for her photographs. She's looking to live more cheaply, and she's looking to reinvent herself, mm -hmm. and that's the basis of the novel. And she's 60, and her love interest is 44. That is true. Which is quite exciting on its own. <laughs> and quite new, quite a new thing. Actually, I think the most exciting thing for her is that she's been married to a man who is very seductive and very mean. He's one of those, I'm sorry, I he know, is he British, <laughs> um, but he is one of those men who says things that on their face don't necessarily sound 
mean, they're like scalpels. The edge is so sharp you don't even see it coming. And I think she meets this man at this moment when she's looking to reinvent herself. And he's a genuinely good person in every way. Yeah. And he actually also makes things. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sort of intrigued by the fact that we know so few people who make things anymore. I mean, I know, I know a lot of people who make money in ways that are very mysterious to me. <laughs> I, I keep sitting next to people who are hedge fund guys at dinner, what and I that? still can't quite figure out what they do. <laughs> so I'm intrigued by people who actually do things. He's a roofer. Yes. He puts roofs on houses. Yes. That, of course, is a metaphor. Hello. Um, but it's also interesting to me, that sense of, of her realizing that there are people who actually make things. Yes, definitely. And what do you have next? What's coming up next for you? Uh, I'm, um, I'm most of the way through an extremely rough draft of a new novel. Um, uh, two, of, two of my sons are one of my sons is a young adult novelist whose fifth book has just been um, published. Oh, what's his name? Christopher Crovaton. Uh -huh. He writes YA books. He's a wonderful writer. Is he really? Yes. How can you stand it? <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> and, um, and his older brother is working on an adult novel, which he hasn't finished yet. Oh, what about <laughs> Maria? Maria's actually a comedy writer, but for the stage and for movies, and really she writes. Writers. Yeah, I know, right? Oh, or as my husband likes to say, not a, not a W-2 income in the house. <laughs> um, but, but Chris and I have talked about the fact that we think there are two different kinds of writers in terms of um, process. One is what we call the run like hell to the end writer. Mm -hmm. And we know that because both of us our run like hell to the end. We don't go back, we don't reread, we don't touch up. We're just trying to get to the end. Quinn is the other kind, which is the can't go on to the next chapter until this chapter is just the way I want it, writer. Hmm. Um, and I have some friends like that, and their books need much less editing sure. than mine do. Mm -hmm. Be but Neither Chris nor I can imagine being Quinn's kind of writer, and he can't imagine being ours. Have it's interesting. Tried it? What would happen if you tried it? Do you think? I think I'd get stuck. Yeah. I think I'd get. I think I'd be like a car in neutral. Right. I wouldn't be able to get back into gear. Huh. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. And so, what about your daily routine as far as writing goes now? Um. You know, I do about three hours worth of things designed to not write. Um, I read newspapers, I talk to my best friend on the phone, I, I see Quinn first thing in the morning because he works out of what used to be his childhood bedroom and is now his office, and then I run out of... You have to. Yeah, so I go upstairs at about 9.30 to my office, which is on the top floor of our house, write for a couple of hours, meet Quinn for lunch down in the dining room at 1 o'clock, go back upstairs, see if there's any more gas in the tank, and if there's not work on speeches or, you know, um, emails or things like that. So. so will you sit there with a blank page trying to wreck your brains, or do you go to the page with the scene in your mind and you just transcribe it? I actually have one little trick which I have found has been very helpful to me and even to other people. I never stop at the end of the day at the end of a chapter. I never stop at the end of a paragraph. Mm -hmm. I never stop at the end of a sentence. Mm -hmm. I stop in mid-sentence. Every because, time. Every time. Because if I come back the next day and I'm in mid-sentence. You know you can begin. Exactly. If I were at the end of a chapter and so I had the challenge of beginning a new chapter, I could rev my motor for days before I got back. What a in gear. Trick. So with that half sentence, I can always get back into it again. Wow. And do you believe in writer's block? Uh, I don't really. Um, I think it's because I was a reporter for so many years where writer's block is not in any way, shape, or form acceptable. But I also think part of it is, um, first of all, people wait for inspiration. Mm -hmm. 
don't know where inspiration is. Where does it live? Um, Which shop? Well, Madeline Langla, who wrote A Wrinkle in Time, once said, inspiration comes during writing, not before it. So if you wait before, it will never happen. Yeah. It's, I, I think writer's block is because you say, I can't write eloquently today. Well, so what? You right, know, there's right. so many times when I can't write eloquently. You sit down, you start to write, you're writing, and you're, it's like slogging through, mm -hmm. through quicksand, and all of a sudden you write a sentence and think, Bam. boom, you're off. Aha, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And you can go back and delete the stuff that wasn't any good and work with the stuff that is. But to do that, you have to sit down and write. And if you walk around the house thinking, I'm blocked, I'm blocked, I'm blocked, right. nothing ever gets no done. So you're not a perfectionist? Um, I, I don't think I'm a perfectionist. I mean, I always live by the, the dicta that the, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Um, I, I always come back to my work afterward. I don't reread my work very much, but when I'm obliged to, I always see things. Mm -hmm that I could have perfected. But I try to get my work in that final draft mm -hmm. as good as I think mm -hmm. it can possibly be. I'm not a perfectionist while I'm doing a draft. Mm -hmm. I like to get it on, you know, on screen. It's right. done. Journalist training again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for coming. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you.